All right. Good afternoon and welcome to this session of the CREATE webinar hosted by CARES. To those of you unfamiliar with CARES, we have been in Singapore since 2013 and we are the University of Cambridge's only research centre outside the UK. Much of our research started out in looking at ways to decarbonize the chemical industry in Singapore, but we have since expanded to maritime, pharmaceutical, and even cities related research. CREATE itself is an international collaboratory in Singapore, housing research centers set up by top global universities. CARES is just one entity out of many others in the CREATE, in the CREATE building. Um, we are excited to be introducing our latest research program called AMPL, which stands for an accelerated manufacturing platform for engineered nanomaterials. As the name suggests, the team have developed the technology to rapidly scale up the manufacturing of, of no novel nanomaterials that have potential to be used in many industries which they aim to collaborate with. Dr. Nicholas Jose, who is the project lead for AMPL, will be speaking first to cover three key areas, technology, product market fit, and supply chain. Dr. Nicholas Jose's research on new synthesis techniques for nanomaterials has spent many years with CARES. What followed were the stepping stones leading up to AMPL. This was a two-year proof-of-concept project for the proposed materials development platform, which led to a spin-off company called Accelerated Materials in the UK that now provides nanomanufacturing services to clients. The vision for AMPL is to scale up these technologies in an automated factory setting with the aim of developing a spin-off company in Singapore. So I will hand this over to Nick now. Thanks very much, Olivia, and thank you for everyone for joining, um, wherever you are. Um, so, as Olivia suggested, this is basically the, the launch presentation for AMPL. So, we just began this project in June, so we're very excited to tell you all about it and hopefully have some great stimulating discussions um, following it. Um, and as she said, uh, I'm the project lead, but I'm also joined here today with uh, Mikhail Kovalev and also Alexei Lapkin who are helping to lead this project. So let's begin. Well, in addition to the fire alarm, I think we're uh, undergoing a new century of crises that I think we all um, are noticing. So whether it's supply chain difficulties, global climate change uh, affecting ecosystems, uh, pandemics, and crumbling infrastructures, these issues are all affecting us and they're only expected to grow even more within the next century. And, you know, part of CARES is the C4T program and what the C4T program has really shown is, you know, in addition to, uh, you know, uh, the recent study on climate change is that we have very little time actually to act on these. So within the next 10 years, we basically need to develop new technologies that will help us reduce our overall footprint and increase the viability of human life, you know, in, in this century and next century. Nanotechnology actually offers many solutions for these problems. So if we can look at supply chain, we can look at developing new catalysts, for example, that can help us convert chemicals such as CO2 into valuable products. We can look at molecules like metorganic frameworks that will help us capture CO2 and prevent uh, emissions. Your recent COVID vaccine, many of these were actually nanoparticles, which you injected into yourself and which helped delivered new drugs into your body. And, you know, we can even look at concrete. We can use nanotechnology to make self-healing concrete more durable structures that we won't have to replace so often. However, many of these materials encounter what we know as the scale of value of death. So in the process from moving from discovery of a material to the wide scale production of material, we go through several stages. Right, so first, a scientist normally synthesizes a material at a gram scale, usually in quite small quantities uh, in a vial. Secondly, they move up in scale, so if they go to even larger vials, actually these are uh, more like vessels in which they make kilo scale amounts, and then from that they go on to factory scale production. However, we often encounter uh, several issues um, when you are scaling up. So first of all, with each stage, you have to conduct many experiments, which involves a lot of trial and error. Um, furthermore, when you switch scales, switch equipment, there's essentially a quality control issue in which 
you have to maintain quality of your materials at each scale. Thirdly, the costs increase almost exponentially when you go to increasing scales. So a vial is much, much cheaper than uh, buying an entire factory. And you know, finally, safety hazards. Chemicals that are relatively safe to use in small quantities in the lab suddenly become incredibly large uh, operational hazards at the ton scale. So, you know, the, the average time cycle for actually going to production is about a decade and it can cost hundreds of millions, which is, you know, it's, it's a huge risk. And if we're talking about, uh, you know, the next 10 years as a critical point to develop new technologies, this is a very tight deadline for us. And furthermore, you know, over the last, you know, few decades, as we've been developing nanotechnology, we've remained in a very low state of technology readiness to push things to the ton scale manufacturer. This low technology readiness has resulted in a lack of local pilot facilities. This is facilities to take materials from the gram scale to the ton scale production. And as a result, many of these materials haven't actually been commercialized. As a result of that, there's a value chain gap. So no one really knows how to take nanomaterials properly to market. And this feeds into itself. So it, it sort of creates this uh, really bad feedback effect um, that we need to overcome to really commercialize nanomaterial technologies properly. So what our idea is, is to combine new technologies in chemical engineering and uh, material science to basically create a new methodology for scaling it that's inherently faster and more reliable. The first step of this is sustainable process design in which we use low cost reagents that are less toxic and require less energy to use. From this, we use new uh, microreactor, oh, sorry about that. From, from this, we use new microreactor technologies that are intensified. So much more efficient than your average vial and uh, much easier to scale than a, a large batch reactor. We also include machine learning. So what machine learning does is it helps us use less experiments. So not so much trial and error, but instead we can dramatically lower the amount of experimental time we need to develop and produce a new material. And finally, we use high throughput ana analytics. So this is basically a way for us to increase the speed of our development by rapidly screening through multiple uh, material systems. So yes, yeah, so let's go over reactor technology. So this is your typical batch reactor. You know, the, the scale of this is around one meter, uh, you know, for, for a kilo scale reactor. And really the, the forces that influence this, so that hydrodynamic shear forces are quite insignificant. So when you look at the mixing within this sort of a reactor, it's not very great. What we've developed is a new kind of reactor. Um, I can discuss in technical details a, a bit more in, uh, uh, in depth uh, following the talk if you like, but inherently what it has is a, a two-phase flow regime. So within the middle of the reactor, we pump a high velocity gas, and then the, uh, uh, the sides of the reactor, we pump liquids. And we pump the, the gases and liquids in such a way that this creates a unique regime at the sides of the, of the tube, uh, which is very high shear. So this high shear provides really excellent mixing and control over nanoparticle formation. And actually, I have a short video here that hopefully you can see uh, the rate at which materials are created. And you can actually see that the output is so thick and is so dense with materials that it produces almost a slurry or a gel. And uh, this is in contrast to the batch reactor technology because this is continuous. It's low clogging and it's easier to scale. So we've tested this reactor platform on a variety of materials to date. Um, this includes materials like layered double hydroxides all the way to organic nanocrystals. And these materials can in fact be used in a number of different applications. So we can look at applications from batteries all the way to biosensors and drugs. So really we've uh, demonstrated the versatility of the, the reactor quite well. And following that, we've demonstrated that it's actually much more efficient than conventional techniques for synthesis. So up to 10 to the five, so about 10,000 times more efficient than uh, conventional techniques using less energy. Furthermore, for some materials, we actually report unprecedented 
uh, you know, particle size distribution. So for those who don't know, the particle size distribution of a nanomaterial is actually very, very important to its properties. So we've actually been able to show that not only can we produce them efficiently, but also with uh, good quality. So what's the microfactory approach and how do we intend to scale it up in this project? Well, taking a single reactor, we synthesize at the gram scale. When we're moving up to the kilo and ton scales, all we do is simply increase the number of those reactors operating in parallel. And with this approach, we hope to scale the, uh, you know, the time and the cost required to create that new material by a factor of 10. So what's the history of this project? Well, you know, it's, it's not come about overnight. So actually since 2015, we've been working on this technology as a part of Cambridge Cares through the uh, Center for Carbon Reduction and Chemical Technology. Um, so, so over you know, the period of 2015 to 2018, we were doing reactor development and lab demonstrations. And in 2018, we worked with the uh, Singapore MIT Alliance for Research and Technology as part of their innovation center to do a proof of concept project, uh, basically integrating the machine learning high throughput analytics approach with our reactors. And with this, we also undertook a, a fair amount of market research to see actually how could we commercialize this technology. As a result of that uh, you know, project, we actually realized there's a huge gap that we need to fill uh, within uh, the, the development of this technology. And that is industrial scale demonstration. So over countless discussions with you know, companies which are large and small, they all require Thing, which is to see that this technology actually works, not just in the lab, but at a scale that they would use. And it's actually, you know, the chemical processing industry is very conservative and it costs a lot of money for them to experiment with the new technology. So they require a bit more effort to adopt a new processing technology. So that's what this project is to do. What we're going to do in this project is build a 100 kilo per day facility for scaling up materials and demonstrate it at a high TRL uh, level. Basically, that we can do instantaneous scale up. So scale up a material in one year and not 10. And thirdly, we are going to commercialize this technology with the industry partnerships that we're making in, within this project within Singapore. You know, these are great goals, but actually there's a lot of challenges to reach them as well. The first and most obvious is how do we make scale up affordable and fast? You know, we have the technology, but actually how do we execute that technology? How do we find the best product market fit? So not just technology fit, how do we actually, you know, find the, the best path to market? And, you know, this is a new day and age in which it's supply chain is actually essential to uh, delivering a product on time. So how do we ensure that given the variability of the supply chain today, that we can have reliable production? So this is a 6.5 million Singapore dollar project funded by the National Research Foundation. Um, and it's a collaboration between Cambridge Cares and Intuitive. Within the first year, we are doing a pilot lab construction and product development with the industry partners. Following that, we're doing process demonstration and product trials with the same industry partners. And following that demonstration, we're doing uh, industrial production uh, of our, uh, our designing our industrial production facility um, uh, with commercial agreements in place and commercializing this uh, technology within Singapore. So I'd like to introduce the team uh, as, it, as it is now. So we actually have some, uh, uh, quite a few people coming on board. So uh, Faye has just recently joined us. She's our automation engineer. Uh, Mikhail, he's uh, been with us quite a, uh, a while. He's our technical uh, product manager. He's responsible for translating industry needs into uh, the, the project uh, objectives. Uh, Kensha is our quality control scientist, so she's ensuring that everything functions appropriately and that we're producing consistent product. And Professor Alexei Lapkin at Cambridge um, is, is guiding the project and is also helping out with our industrial partnerships. 
And finally, myself, I'm uh, uh, leading the project, so helping out and, and guiding uh, activities and technical and uh, business development. And in addition to that, we are hiring some more people. So uh, if you are interested, we are definitely accepting applications in several areas. Right. So um, what sort of technology are we actually going to apply in this uh, pilot facility? Well, a, a generic process for uh, fabricating nanomaterials and a, and a wet synthesis follows this basic diagram. And it involves taking reactants, so precursors, pumping it into a reactor, purifying the product, and then drawing that into a powder. Now in the lab scale, normally your pumps are quite small and it's actually not so hard to achieve accurate flow because you have things like syringe pumps, which are sort of direct drive equipment. But at the you know, factory scale, actually precise flow is not so simple to attain. So actually we need to think and, about and purchase pumps that will uh, give us this precision. If we look at reactors, this is an example of one of our lab reactors. It's quite small. You can actually hold it within your hand quite easily. We need to scale that up in a number of strategies. So this is one prototype that we've been developing, basically a system that operates eight reactors in parallel. Um, so the, the, you know, we, we have to think about you know, how are we going to achieve uniform distribution across parallel reactors and how are we going to establish a protocol that allows them to be easily maintained? You know, purification, the cheapest, uh, you know, most affordable method for purification by far is uh, filtration. Normally, this is done in a lab and a sort of Buchner funnel setup at, that you can see here. Um, that's quite common. We have to think about new filtration strategies that are scalable and continuous. And so one of these uh, technologies that we'll be trying out are niche filters that are uh, commonly used in the pharmaceutical industry, thinking about new strategies for how to reduce, uh, you know, the, the waste that we produce during filtration, and also how to increase the speed that we do it. And finally, drying. Well, actually drying in the lab, it's quite simple. You do it in an oven, you put a, you put a little tray in, and it's done in, in about an hour or two. But when you actually start to go to the factory scale, and you start to think about how to do it continuously, you have to get entirely different equipment, so such as spray dryers that can operate continuously. Um, so, you know, it's uh, you know scaling up the new technology involves uh, getting the appropriate equipment in place to actually produce uniform product, um, just as we do at the lab scale. So, um, that's actually one of the uh, you know approaches that we're doing, getting the exact techniques that are required. How are we going to be flexible? So this also links back to supply chain. Well, the conventional strategy for you know, developing a process and procuring all the equipment is that you use multiple suppliers. So for each bit of the uh, process, you would use a different supplier for equipment. Or you could just hire one company to do it all for you. You know, this is, this is nice because, OK, you can rely on your supplier's expertise to do the process design. However, when you start thinking about supply chain, what if one of your suppliers has a gap in their supply chain? Or what if their company you know, ex has some shortages? This actually leaves you vulnerable in case you need help in your process. And long term, you're reliant on your suppliers for those services costs and for scaling up the process even more. What we're doing is a modular approach. So um, you know, let's take, for example, our precursor stage in which we're delivering materials for the reactor. We can separate this into parts in which all the parts can have multiple different suppliers. So even if there's a gap within the supply chain, we can easily go to another supplier in order to supply that part to create this facility. So it's, you know, the, the, the advantage is, is that this strategy is much more resilient because you can multi-source equipment. You can actually improve your equipment and change it. So let's say you switch from one material to another, um, you need some different equipment, you can actually very easily do that. And longer term, this is actually easier to maintain because you don't have to rely on a single supplier. However, the, the, the drawback of this method that we are of course aware of 
is that you need high expertise to do this. You need very trained and skilled people. And you also have a higher initial cost of your design, which would actually you know, be up front, but later on, you would have much lower costs in sustaining this. How are you going to be efficient? So, uh, you know, again, with a conventional process strategy, this is normally controlled through a variety of means. So, you know, uh, older processes that have a lot of manual control. So actually someone will go and uh, switch a valve or push a button. Um, and there are some, you know, chemical industry does have automation in place. So there are local computers that will be on equipment, um, you know, that are behind the automation. Um, you know, and, and you know, these methods are great because you don't need incredible expertise to operate push button equipment. However, when you start be, you know, having very manual operation, you have more operational hazards. Um, because things are disconnected, you are not really able to collect data efficiently. And it's hard to adjust and optimize uh, uh, equipment computationally. So let's say you have an entire process where things are operating uh, on the independently and you have manual operation, it requires a lot more human labor to collect data on that process. So what's the IoT strategy or sort of industry 4.0 strategy? Well, what we're doing is we're implementing a, a local PLC. So these are basically computers, uh, uh, process-based computers into the, uh, each element of the process. And then we're linking those PLCs to a cloud. What happens then is that once we have a cloud, it's very easily to uh, communicate data to both humans and artificial intelligence tools, so such as machine learning algorithms, so that we can rapidly optimize our system. What the benefits of this is, is that there's lower operator dependence, it's easier to collect data, and it's easier to actually change our process. But of course, like the modular strategy that I just recently discussed, there's a, you know, a lot higher technical expertise required. So we're going to have to have very skilled people to do this. And initially, you know, if you're having local PLCs everywhere, you're going to need uh, more equipment, more uh, control equipment. So there's an initial higher cost. So moving on to product market fit, how do we actually commercialize this? So we have technology that's working well, but how do we actually sell it to the market and make it economically viable? Well, this is something that we actually explored a lot to our, our spinoff company in the UK, which is Accelerated Materials, which is basically a consulting company helping uh, other companies to scale up their materials and, and new products. Throughout this uh, you know, effort, we've done a lot of market analysis. And within our domains of expertise, which are in the healthcare, energy storage, and functional coatings areas, we can se separate them into their growth rates and how fast they can go to market. So functional coatings actually has the fastest rate to market, although it's not the fastest growing. And if we look at within this market, you know, uh, there are several key areas that are growing. So there's the anti-corrosive market, there's the conductive market. So coatings that are re resisting rust, that are allowing uh, conductive coatings basically, you know, allow electricity to flow through coating. And then there's antimicrobial materials which basically limit the growth of microbes on a surface. And I, actually that market is one of the fastest growing and the largest within the coatings industry. So what's driving this market? So we have several key drivers. So construction is one, so infrastructure development. We've of course have COVID, which has basically accelerated needs for clean environments. Sustainability as well. So actually uh, most, Current antimicrobials are, uh, you know, harmful to workers. So they have cancer-causing properties or endocrine-disrupting properties that are hazardous. Um, so people want to switch to ones that are less hazardous. And also that ties into regulations. So actually, regulations are clamping down on the current or uh, previous antimicrobial technologies. And actually, you know. Uh, you know, the problem of microbial growth is huge worldwide, and it costs about $650 billion worldwide. And that's the cost of basically replacing new things, uh, replacing old things that have decayed due to microbial corrosion, um, and also the health costs. So, you know, uh, microbial uh, infections affect millions of people per year, and that's a huge cost to our healthcare system. 
So the solution that we explored in our previous project, which was with the Smart Innovation Center, was nano zinc oxide. So nano zinc oxide is very nice because it's pretty non-toxic and zinc is actually quite widely available. Um, however, there are some key challenges in producing nano zinc oxide in the antimicrobial form. Um, and that is that the equipment costs uh, are high to produce this. It uses a lot of energy and there are hazards in operation. So actually a lot of organic solvents are used. The process that we developed, however, um, was significantly better in terms of control over particle morphology. So within a single reactor, you can produce all these different morphology characteristics, which link back to the antimicrobial activity. It uses much less space and it operates at room temperature. So overall, when you look at the uh, the cost associated with producing a reactor with high capacity, this is much, much lower. Okay, so, so you can see on this red curve, the estimated cost of scaling up a conventional reactor per kilo per day. So if you wanna go 100 kilo per day, this is you know a million dollars. But when you do a number of strategy, this rate pretty much assumes, uh, remains constant. So, uh, the scale of costs we showed was significantly less. So how does this nanozinc oxide work? Well, you add this nanozinc oxide into a matrix, which is basically glue that will help it stick to a surface. And then you can apply it to a, a variety of surfaces, such as in hospitals or on pavements, food packaging, uh, you know, really pretty much any surface. And uh, we've also been doing some trials with this material in the real world setting. So this was one trial with Dow Chemical, HDB, and BT Sports, which is a local coatings company within Singapore. And what we did was we applied this nano zinc oxide coating to a pavement. Um, and I, I think, you know, in Singapore, the, it's very hot, very humid, lots of moisture. And what happens when you uh, have, after six months, a new pavement, actually you get this very brown substance developing on top of that uh, pavement. And that's not only an aesthetic um, you know, uh, problem, it's also a slip hazard and it requires constant cleaning, right? So you know, I think you've probably seen people around jet washing pavements recently. So what if you had a coating that basically prevented that from happening? So what we did is we applied a nano zinc oxide within one of these coatings and we showed actually it significantly reduces the amount of bacterial growth on those pavements, thus reducing the amount of water that you need to use to clean and the labor as well. And also it just looks a lot nicer. Right. One thing you also need to realize, you know, when, when you're bringing a product to market is exactly how as a company, you're gonna create a product that a customer really wants. And I think, you know, product market fit is, you know, it's a very simple phrase, but actually it's a very complex problem to solve because within bringing a, a product to market, within bringing a product to a customer, it's not just about the customer, right? There's actually many different actors that you need to consider. So with, uh, you know, a university startup, of course, you need to consider the needs of both the university. You need to consider investors, what they want, suppliers of various materials and technologies that you need to rely on. What the government thinks of that, so your regulation, uh, your funders, and also the end users. So if you're selling you know, a, a coding, let's say, to a, a building developer, what are the actual residents gonna think of this new technology? So you, know, you don't just need to consider who's your customer, you need to consider everyone else involved. So that makes product market fit actually a very complicated problem. And what we've done throughout the project and throughout previous projects is have a basically a mapping exercise in which we explore all these different areas and we, we basically interview them, find out what they need so we can provide value throughout the chain. So if we can, you know, let's say broadly summarize what each element of this value chain demands, um, this is just, a, you know, like I said, a very brief summary. Uh, we can definitely go into depth uh, more in the, the question panel, but, um, you know, we can separate it into these areas. So investors, for example, 
they really care the most about valuation growth. Right? So they care about how much your company is going to be worth in five years. That's pretty much what they're after. Suppliers, they really care about how much supply you need from them. And that actually affects their pricing model. So if you're doing only one-off purchases, then they're going to be less reluctant to work with you with, uh, um, and uh, give you higher prices. So, uh, you know, really suppliers within the, you know, the, the value chain want to see that you are going to be a consistent source of revenue for them. The university system, of course, we cannot neglect. And what the universities are typically after is to see that the research that they're funding and they're hosting has measurable outcomes that you generate the social impact that the university system is prioritizing. And also at the end of the day, they've been funding patents. So they wanna be able to generate at least some sort of return to show uh, from their licenses. The government of course is concerned more about more uh, system-wide effects, so ecosystem effects, and of course about public safety. So if you're implementing new technology, nanotechnology you have to be very careful and ensure at every stage that you are validating the safety of your material. The company. So you have to consider the company itself as well and what people in the company actually prioritize. So for us, sustainability has actually been a, a huge drive for the company. So actually at every step of the development, we are concerned about how we can generate sustainable technology and from an environmental perspective, from an economical perspective and a social perspective. You know, startup companies are also risky endeavors. So you have to make sure that the work is exciting enough, right? And it's actually growing enough so that you can give people who are gonna take that risk to join that new company, the right incentives to stay on with it. Of course, the customer is, uh, you know, uh, uh, obviously very important here. And what we've noticed through interviews, the key driver for many customers that are businesses our economic earnings, so basically the ability to make more money or the ability to save money. And, you know, there are a lot of other drivers that we've been talking about, so like regulation, sustainability, um, supply chain issues. But at the end of the day, many businesses, if those are your customers, are concerned really with these more short term uh, financial incentives. And at the end of the day, there's going to be the end users, so the public. And actually these are the segments that have the most variability, but you still need to quantify what those are. So for example, if you're a, a, you know, a person living in an estate, um, you are actually, yeah, you're concerned about the aesthetics, so how it looks. You're concerned about how much time it would cost you to clean and about how much money it would also uh, cost you. And, you know, a, a, that's something that we're a problem we're still trying to crack exactly what end users prefer because this can actually vary depending on your country as well. So Singapore and the UK, the end user is actually going to be different. So you know part of our value chain analysis includes that geographical component. And actually, how do we actually deliver this value? Um, this is actually a component we're still examining at the moment. And the reason we can be a bit more flexible with this is because we're more technology driven. And we've actually demonstrated in quite a few cases that we can be profitable in all these different models. So within the R&D services model, if we were to have an R&D services company, what we would provide would be basically the expertise to make new antimicrobial products. If we were to do materials manufacturing, um, basically this materials that we would provide would basically let companies improve the resistance of their products to microbes with low costs and low toxicity. If we were to supply this equipment to other companies, this would basically enable them to have faster in-house development of antimicrobial products. Um, so base, and, and, and if we license the technology to them, you know, this essentially lets them uh, uh, not only, they don't have to do the development, they already have the technology. Right, so they can just make them. And you know, we're not limiting it to antimicrobial products. I just want to say in, in this slide, this, these are just examples of how we can do it for value. But because we have such a wide breadth um, of you know, materials that we can create, we've, uh, for this purpose, we've sort of focused on 
the zinc oxide into microbial products. So in the end, you know, obviously, what we're trying to do is generate net value for Singapore. And what we can see is that, you know, if we're able to implement this technology at the large scale, if we're able to have this instantaneous scale up of new materials, we can create benefits that, uh, you know, reach not only from industry, but to the environment and to the public. So we'll create new jobs, both for, you know, SMEs and MNCs, help people reach better products, but also, you know, these, you know, effects will trickle down to the public. So, you know, Singapore will have, uh, you know, new jobs in more sustainable manufacturing, more advanced manufacturing that will help sustain the economy. Um, we'll be producing less you know, environmentally dangerous processes so that you know, we can meet those environmental goals throughout the next decade. And if we look at higher education, we're actually training people to work in these really advanced fields. So actually we're helping the ecosystem, uh, you know, put people into the ecosystem that will help uh, people beyond, you know, nanoparticle synthesis to gain that expertise, right? And so, so these are just a list of the, the cumulative benefits that we are projecting. And, you know, overall, you know, we're, we're trying to have a, you know, a system-wide effect. So basically helping Singapore grow in a way that, um, you know, fits Singapore the best, combining, you know, both industrialization with needs for environments, the people, and for growth in the future. And of course, I'd like to thank you all for attending and also the National Research Foundation for, for funding this work that we're very excited to kick off um, over the next two years. And with that, um, I'd like to hand it over to you, Olivia. And I think we, we've got a panel to do. Yeah, thank you so much, Nick, um, for the introduction. Um, so I will quickly introduce the panel members. So. Apart from Nick mentioned uh, as the project lead, um, we have other key members. So firstly, we have Dr. Mikhail Kovalev, who is the Technical Development Manager of the AMPLE project. Dr. Kovalev joined CARES in 2020 as a Senior Research Fellow on a project that focused on utilizing CO2 waste for more circular chemical industrial processes. He had prior experience working on nanomaterials and coatings at ASTAR, and additional experience working in industry, where he worked for seven years as a senior researcher in Samsung Electronics in Korea. Next, we have Professor Alexei Lapkin, who is not only a principal investigator on AMPL, but a key PI on several other CARES research programs. He is a professor of sustainable reaction engineering at the University of Cambridge, leading a research group that focuses on developing clean, intensive processes for the manufacture of molecules and functional materials additionally exploring novel methods of machine learning for automated process optimization in large-scale manufacturing. Lastly, AMPLE is a project that is a collaboration between CARES and NTUITIV, supported by NRF Central Gap Fund. Mr. Frank Peltner is the Senior Assistant Director of Technology Development at NTUITIV. He has extensive experience in the field of precision engineering and a strong background in technology transfer from lab to the marketplace. Mr. Peltner will be working on Ample's IP management and tech transfer as the project starts to engage with industrial partners in the pharmaceutical energy and functional coating sector. So with that, I will hand it over to Frank to start this panel session. Yeah, thank you, Olivia, for the good introduction and a nice introduction. Uh, yeah, welcome everybody to the panel discussion. And uh, yeah, I just uh, jump into and and I mean we all know that nanomaterials can be found in a wide range of products, ranging from duct delivery solutions to high definition electronics. And these nanomaterials are of course vital to the industry and also to the academic research due to to the new unique I mean features that they can provide. But of course, I mean, uh, the, the issue with nanomaterials is that many, many uh, industries have tried or even researchers have tried to scale that up uh, in the past. And currently, until today, I mean, uh, the nanotechnology development uh, face technological issues and also financial problems. And uh, I hope Ample will overcome this. I mean, it has promising results. So, and I would just like to ask Nick, so when this was actually, when you developed the shear reactor, 
uh, technology that was in 2014-15. And uh, did you actually have the vision already in mind that you would develop a complete system to manufacture nanomaterials at industry scale? Thanks. Exactly. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I mean, when I started that project, I was a PhD student, actually, and uh, my focus was much more fundamental. Um, and my focus was on actually how does hydrodynamics affect material formation? Because I saw, you know, we've seen this as a, as a key roadblock to actually doing manufacturing materials, because we don't know exactly what effects you know, of, of uh, mixing or hydrodynamics, um, you know, how they change the formation. So this was, let's say, a very long-term vision that I didn't think we were actually going to address, but given that we created this technology, it actually became a potential that we could do. Okay. Uh, yeah, so as a, I mean, if you talk about uh, nanomaterials, so, Nanomaterials normally are developed in a lab by researchers and, and the first must, uh, I mean, they mix many chemicals, which is also a time consuming and a very labor intensive uh, activity. So, and uh, these procedures, I mean, are still in place for most of the nanomaterials used in, in research and investigation in small quantities. Uh, so, the problem is this takes a long time. Like you said, it takes 10 years actually to, to actually enter the market for nanomaterial up to 10 years old. So how do you think the development time can be shortened in the most or more cost uh, effective and more efficient way? Uh, Alexa, would you like to take Yeah, Alexa, time? yeah. Sure. Um, I think uh, the transition to uh, or better penetration of digital tools into R&D is one of the answers. It's not the only answer, but it's certainly one of the answers. Um, handling the information about uh, chemistry and handling um, design of experiments in a in a more efficient way is, is, is one of the solutions which allows to generate hypotheses about what's going on and uh, connect uh, various aspects of a process um, into a kind of a coherent model, which can be then trans sort of extrapolated towards manufacturing is, 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 is a very challenging thing to do by hand or by to do by traditional uh, process engineering tools and so the um, uh, the current penetration of machine learning and AI and digital tools into R&D is, is, is what we see as a as a way of addressing this challenge and certainly AM has been very uh, active and Nick and his group is very active to in uh, in adopting the tools which coming out from the labs and um, sort of development in um, uh, algorithms and then also later the um, uh, high throughput technologies and automated lab technologies which just allow you to generate data faster um, those uh, those are i think indispensable in um, advanced materials research yeah i, I mean i would uh, and i have an additional question to this one so is the future plan actually of the spin-off company to actually develop an ai driven development tool to actually design new nanomaterials or hybrid nanomaterials to reduce development time. I mean, this would, I mean, of course, this would result in a more cost effective way and would definitely shorten the time of development. That means you, you use a simulation to actually design new materials, new nanomaterials. Is, would that be something that would be the overall goal of the company later? I mean, in the long run. I don't think I can tell you the defin definitive <laughs> answer for now because it depends. Uh, right now, the company is adopting the materials development protocols, which allows you to optimize the manufacturing process for already known material rather than discovery of new materials. Mm. But AI for discovery of new materials is a, is a is one of the hottest topics at the moment in 
uh, in this field. So yeah. it's a it's a huge race who gets there first. Um, so, but it's it's at the moment fairly academic yet. Mm, yeah, I know. Okay, thank you. Uh, also, uh, I have a question, maybe maybe on at Nick and I address it to Nick on Mikael probably. So, I mean, you you, you have a scale up approach for the nanomaterials, uh, and by by designing your nanomaterials or even replicate nanomaterials that already exist in the lab. So, so. Are you leveraging on something like design for manufacturing principles? Do you have these kind of things in place? Yeah, so, um, so can you can uh, your question is if we have manufacturing design principles in place for our pilot design? Correct. So I mean, you have uh, some strategies, methodologies, tools that that you that you use uh, in the development uh, that that actually has a seamless transition to a cost effective transition to man to the manufacturing environment of tomorrow. Yes, yes. So actually, you know, agile development actually underlies everything within this project. And, you know, we, we use agile, all, you know, from a basic day to day operations all the way to designing the facility. So that that's kind of the concept behind the modular factory design is that you can actually but be much more flexible with your manufacturing. So we don't see building a manufacturing facility as a fixed thing. It's th something that needs to be able to evolve over time. Right, so, so what we're doing is we're starting it, we're building something functional, but of course we want to leave room and we want to leave the capability to improve that. And so from that concept, we get you know, practices so how we do operations, for example, how we manage tasks within the project, how we design equipment. So we design equip, we, we select equipment that is not fixed. So it, we're not locked to one specific supplier that we can, but basically we're designing processes that we can multi-source, use different sorts of equipment and uh, basically improve it over time. So, so I guess I, I hope that answers your question in terms of yeah, how we're designing our manufacturing process. Yeah, it does. Thank you. Uh, maybe uh, back to Alexei. So, so, so how actually, I mean, maybe you can elaborate a little bit. How does the manufacturing process actually benefits from the use of AI control, from an AI control system? Because you mentioned uh, data collection and all this before. So, so what, what maybe you can elaborate a little bit more? There are two steps or maybe more. Um, we originally were thinking about this many years ago. We had a research council project on connecting um, machine learning and robotics in the lab with machine learning and robotics at the plant. Um, and the idea was that we would link the two together so that the learning from a, um, a lab, and this, this relates to the kind of equipment what Nick's company is using, uh, when it's a scale scale out type equipment, um, so the manufacturing principles are similar to the lab equipment, um, but the type of information you need is a little bit different uh, in in the different scales. So the the connection is to try to explore at the lab scale and create models. Um, as early as, as possible and as fast as possible, and then figure out what of the parameters and what what should be changed when we go to the um, the the plant. And because the plant has similar mathematics in place, then it would be easy and faster to do. Uh, then we could also look at diagnostics, fault diagnostic, quality control, and all of these aspects. Uh, much easier because the models are already in place, you have mm, sensors in place, and so your um, support for um, uh, manufacturing is, 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 is kind of much, much easier. And that's one of the trends in manufacturing these days is that to have uh, a digital twin of your equipment and statistical models running in parallel so that you have um, fault detection, quality control, scheduling, and all of the tasks um in place automatically 
Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, Nick, uh, I have a, also something uh, for you, probably maybe you can comment on this. So nanotechnology, I mean, has the potential to, to actually uh, innovate a lot of industry fields. Uh, one of them is agriculture. So you can actually innovate feed food sectors uh, in agriculture. Would that be something that, in the, that actually you would consider in the future? To work yeah, definitely. On definitely. I think agriculture, yeah, is becoming even more important now because, because of climate change. So yeah. Um, yeah. You, you're going to need new, new methods of you know, taking care of crops. Um, so even, even zinc oxide, uh, it's, it's being applied to crops nowadays. And if you look at fertilizer use or pesticide use, for example, people are trying to reduce that amount. So actually nano pesticides, nano fertilizers are actually much more efficient. Um, so yeah, that's, that's definitely an area that we want to look at. I think the things we want to consider is the validation time. So how many years does it actually take to validate that this technology is better? and adoption time. So how many farmers are ready to try out new technology? Yeah, yeah that, that leads me actually to the next question. So certification of nanomaterials and also their processes is an important factor for the adoption of nanomaterials. So do, do, do you have toxicology issues? Uh, I mean, you working framework that is actually not developed. Uh, you have the technical characterization technique that are actually the protocols are actually not in place for all these things for for a lot of nanomaterials and also for the future developed nanomaterials and and this is challenging because it takes a long time to do this. So what is what is your opinion on this? I mean maybe you can share some of your views and your strategy to I mean how would you address this? I mean by by moving on with your company. Right. Um. So actually maybe I can give this question to Mikhail because he's the yeah. Okay. He's a development expert, so he knows all about the, uh, the requirements. Certification, okay. Yes. Yeah, Mikael, please join. Sure. Uh, for the certification, most of nanomaterials are kind of not known and their paths are also unknown at the moment. So, of course, for many of them, we need to do assessment and uh, pass through the most of the tests like uh, cytotoxicity and so on if especially if this nanomaterial is going to be in contact with the human or any other animals or so on, so how it's affect on the on the environment and so on but fortunately for the current developments such as zinc oxides right it's very well known material and mm. uh, it's been assessed uh, by many groups and yeah many researchers that is pretty safe in terms of like the cytotoxicity and so on, right? Uh, yeah, going back to the uh, uh, agriculture sector, yeah, of course, uh, some of the materials or maybe some, especially like the pesticides or fertilizers, they need to be assessed in any way. And as Nick told, yeah, how much time it will take, nobody knows. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a challenge. I mean, it took a long time actually to actually put the definition for uh, graphene actually in place, the ISO definition, to what actually is graphene so, so as a nanomaterial. So of course, I mean, as a lower hanging fruits for, for your developments, you, you, you look at the materials that are already in the market that are approved to actually have a, a short term market, I mean, lepto market. Yeah. Development. Oh, yeah, the other thing is like to look for the materials that are not in contact with the human, right? Or uh the the human will use some protective equipment when this they're working with these materials yeah so to minimize the contact for example some adsorbents or yeah, catalysts as well mm. yeah. okay thank you um one also another question maybe uh also to nick uh in the long run nanomaterials will be a commodity and nobody can run away from this and uh, which would result in, in, in high volumes, I mean, sell volumes at low margins because the price will be reduced because you have many players who will enter the market. Because once you have approved technologies and it works, you have more players. And in order to actually move up the value chain for these companies, these material companies, 
like yourself, uh, what actually other services, other strategies, I mean, can you actually, or do you have in mind to actually climb up the value chain? Are you offering, are you, are you moving from a material or service company even to a licensing company, are you moving maybe up in the long run to a device manufacturer or device developer? Yeah, thanks. I mean, that's that's a great question. And I think actually there's a question in the chat about contract research. So I, this hopefully answers that. So, you know, at the beginning stage, obviously we're starting at lean. Um, we don't have really the capabilities, you know, let's say to start making, let's, uh, a whole building that's antimicrobial. We wouldn't be able to do that. So we're starting mm. from what we have, right, which is manufacturing technology, right? So moving from technology and expertise, of course, we want to produce um, for the market. So maybe even devices or software. So I think Alexei might, might yeah. hint at that. Yeah. So, but that, that all depends on our process of finding out where the best value is within the market and how we can, you know, uh, where, where it would be best to grow towards. Um, so definitely we want to not just stay within commodity materials, but actually use our manufacturing expertise to make devices. And that will basically give us a competitive advantage over everyone else if we can have that capability. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, one last question, maybe, uh, I mean, you can decide who would like to answer it. So if you had a magic crystal ball, so where would you see the company, the, 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 the spin-off company that will be incorporated uh, later this year in five years down the road, uh, if the developments are successful? I mean, it's, I would say it's a smart guess. Yeah, yeah. So um, I think, you know, probably Alex, I mean, we've all had these discussions a lot with, you know, Alex and Mikkel, basically, what's our, our five year roadmap. And I think what our five year roadmap is looking at at the moment, is that in five years, we'll have the capability, basically, to be to do, you know, advanced materials manufacture, as well as technology licensing. So basically, we can make materials for growing markets, right? So growing emerging markets such as batteries, such as healthcare. Um, and we can also license out, you know, technologies to other companies that really need our manufacturing capabilities. Um, let's say for what maybe fertilizers or other commodity materials. So if, if I look in that crystal ball, I'll see it is a combination of, you know, we've developing the manufacturing capabilities at let's say one ton per day scales and being able to rapidly distribute that so that you know you know it's going to be 2027 so we'll have three years left till 2030 right <laughs> so we'll be able to make micro promising maybe alexa and michael you can also comment on that as well yeah we also thinking about like the distribute on distributed manufacturing so where you can uh, license the technology together with a small plant and if for example the client don't want to to produce a lot of material and he don't want to rely on the supply chain or single manufacturer so we can supply for him some equipment and the, the procedure how to how to make this material and if uh, the client's company going to build up and grow in the future we can supply him more equipment and put into the role so yeah we'll be like the more distributed yeah so currently everyone is speaking about the crypto and so on this is kind of the similar similar thing but in case of the materials yeah and and i would add that we will be in five years time the hottest company on the uh, on the uh in the materials design and manufacture in the Southeast Asia, and everybody build after our contracts. Thank you, Alexei. Thank you, everybody. Uh, I that's it from from my side. Uh, so back to Olivia. Yeah. Thank you for all the um, very strong answers and ending it on a very solid note. 
Um, moving on to questions, uh, there were a few people who asked about the future of the company, but since that's been answered, I'll move on. Uh, someone asked if industry partners have already been identified with Ample. Yes, so we, we have identified industry partners um, and we're just in the process of confirming their roles within the, the project. But we, we're not going to disclose anything at the moment. Okay, no worries. And moving on, this is more of a technical question, so I will probably direct it to Mikhail. Um, someone wrote, there have been some reports of high shear microreactors. Is there a challenge for dissolved gases to be perturbed in the system? It will be limited to oxidic materials due to problem of dissolved gases in the systems. Can you comment on the general attributes of particles formed by such processes? I think it's better for Nick, right, Nick? Okay, yeah. yeah. So the question is about dissolved gases. Yeah. Within the process. Um, we haven't had a problem with dissolved gases in our process, and we've been synthesizing materials for a while. So at least for the materials that we've been making, dissolved gases are not an issue. So of course, if you have a specific problem with, so I keep on saying it, dissolved gases, then you can you know, reach out to us and we can, we can talk a bit about it. Um, our, our reactor technology is, of course, a bit different than the others, which might have some cavitation issues, for example. So uh, uh, we have a different hydrodynamic profile, so maybe that is um, it's, uh, changing things. All right. Um, another question that, uh, that I have to ask is, um, are there certain industries that be might more receptive to adopting nanomaterials or have already? Therefore, it would be easier to move into those markets first rather than into a completely new industry. Can you comment on that? Yeah, Mikhail, do you want to talk? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Uh, yes, there's some, uh, yeah, uh, the, there are different companies, so some companies are very welcoming new technologies and so on. Some, yeah, have a little bit resistant to some to some changes because of, uh, yeah, I have met these different company profiles, of course. Yeah, some of the companies, they uh, see their manufacturing is working well. And yeah, even it was established like tens of years ago and they don't want to touch it because of <laughs> it is working. And don't, yeah. But some are very innovative and like uh, very open to the new technologies and like, especially for those uh, high shield micro, micro reactors. So, yeah. All right. Um, I might do this as a last question, uh, just bearing the essence of time. So if anyone has something really urgent, do send it in and we'll see how we go. But this question someone sent is, um, and this might be more for Nick and Mikhail to answer. Um, what advice would you give other researchers starting from an academic environment who are interested in commercializing their work? So oh. whoever would want to answer first. <laughs> <laughs> Probably I will start then I will pass it to Nick. Yeah. So. Uh, Previously, I have been working in quite a big company and we have been working together with universities as well for the, some new developments and so on. And uh, I think from my point of view, uh, if you have a new technology and you want to commercialize it, yeah, you need to understand whether it will be market viable or someone needed this technology because of many of new technologies, although they are looking like promising and so on, they have a lot of problems and uh, not really fitting to any of a product. Uh, so that's why it's like, first of all, you need to understand whether this product is needed by someone, right? And yeah, and uh, whether this product is possible to, to scale up and commercialize uh, at the later stage. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's a good question. I mean, everyone, everyone, of course, is different in different areas of research. Um, but I would say if you're going to do academic research to start up company, your main priority should not be making loads and loads of money. 
Um, so there's a lot of sacrifice and motivation that's beyond the financial incentive that you will need to have to be able to carry out this work. So um, make sure you enjoy it and you're motivated by it and by the people around you. Um, it all starts from there. So that's the main advice I would give. I hope that um, has inspired our any early career researchers who are attending today. Um, and with that, I um, uh, someone did ask what is the what would be the proper contact channels for Ample. And I think I was just going to add that we will be sending out post meeting materials after this. So some links to the web page and to Nick, who is very likely the main contact person, and also possibly the slides that you've seen today. So we will be sending all of that out either today or on Monday. So um, hang tight um, and we'll, you'll get all the information soon. But thank you very much everyone for attending. We've run a little bit over time and with the fire alarm at the beginning. So thank you everyone for your patience and, and the speakers as well for attending. Uh, it was a very good talk. <laughs>